thank you for coming. It is a little peculiar, but everything is these days. But I'm really thrilled you're here. Um, this is my second middle grade book. It's for kids who are a little bit older. The protagonist is 13 years old. So I seem to be progressing. But my next book has is an insect road trip. So I, I think I've maybe gone backwards on the evolutionary scale, that is. Um, the book is set in 1974 in Somerville, Massachusetts, during a time of social upheaval when the president, Nixon, is under investigation and possible impeachment. And the Vietnam War is raging, and there are protesters and anti-protesters and women's liberation is growing. Women are asking for more rights, more equality. The nation was divided, which all has echoes in the present day. And I think sometimes it's easier to see more clearly what's going on in one's present day by reading about the past. And that's why I like historical fiction. It's called Stealing Mount Rushmore. I'm going to read the first chapter. Can you hear me through this? You have to nod. Smiling doesn't work. What? <laughs> chapter 1. Boston Herald American. July 15th, 1974. Moocher. Missing again. I sat at the kitchen table reading the newspaper, waiting for Dad to get home from work. Someone had stolen Moocher, the parrot, from the Stoneham Zoo again. I liked the look of him on the front page with his head tipped a little, staring at the camera in a friendly way. Teddy, my six-year-old brother, sat next to me with his most precious possession, a 64-color box of Crayola crayons with a built-in sharpener. Moocher got stolen again, I said. We'd worried a lot about Moocher last year when he went missing the first time. Minnie, his mate for life, had been getting ready to lay some eggs, and she'd only take food from him. The first thief must have read about poor starving Minnie in the paper like we did. He must have felt rotten about what he'd done since he turned Moocher over to a priest who gave him back to the zoo. Teddy looked up from his Batman coloring book. Is Minnie okay? She's got two little chicks this time. How big are they? Don't know, but they need Moocher to feed them. Teddy's got a sad kind of face to begin with, but the hungry baby birds made it way worse. They'll find him, I said, and he got back to filling in Batman's cape. Teddy believed I could fix any problem like I was some superhero who could make everything okay. I was only 13 years old with no superpowers and there wasn't much I could do about finding a stolen parrot. But I wasn't going to tell him that since he had enough to worry about. The article in the paper said Moocher was really friendly. People could walk around the bird aviary, hold out handfuls of peanuts, and he'd land right on their arms for a snack. He was a super rare kind of parrot, too, from some island in the Pacific Ocean, worth a thousand dollars. That's a lot of money for a bird. But even so, crooks should stick to stealing cash and gold and diamonds and keep their hands off live animals, especially friendly parrots with baby chicks counting on them. I moved my chair a little so I get the air from the fan full blast and stared at the Mount Rushmore salt and pepper shakers sitting next to the napkin holder in the middle of the table. The president's faces on the shakers were kind of lumpy and pasty white. Salt came out of the top of the heads of George Washington and Thomas Jefferson who were stuck together. The pepper came out of the Teddy Roosevelt and Abe Lincoln heads. Jefferson Chin had a few chips where the two shakers fit together like puzzle pieces. I should have been on Mount Rushmore, but I wasn't. They're all men up there carved into that mountainside in South Dakota, 
Dad was counting on the orderly arrival from left to right of a baby George, a baby Thomas, a baby Teddy, and finally, a baby Abe. But after George showed up, I was born, a girl. So I ended up being named after a near miss, Susan B. Anthony. She almost made it up on that mountain, but Congress wouldn't spend the extra money. I think the money was a big fat excuse. Susan B. Anthony fought her whole life for a woman's right to vote and Congress didn't want her up there giving the stink eye to those four presidents who got elected by a bunch of men. Mom resisted the unlucky name of Susan since she had a cousin with that name who drowned in Boston Harbor on New Year's Eve after she fell off a ferry at age seven. They never found the body. The B in Susan B. Anthony stands for Brown L. So everyone just called me Nell, or Nellie, not very presidential. Teddy knelt on his chair, bent over his coloring book, a tight grip on his black crayon. He only had a stub left since he'd been working his way through the Batman coloring book for a week, and it took a lot of black. It's two o'clock already, I said. Eat your sandwich. Teddy ignored me and kept coloring. He didn't like to stop in the middle of a section and he hardly ever colored outside the lines. If he slipped up, if Batman's mask or the skyscrapers of Gotham City didn't have crisp edges, he'd turn the page and start on a new picture. Eat your sandwich. I reached over and made a grab for his box of crayons. Hey, he said, and gave me a look. Eat your sandwich. Okay. Teddy closed his coloring book and slid the black crayon stub into its slot in the box. I pushed his peanut butter and jelly sandwich over in front of him on a paper napkin. He started eating. One bite, chew. One swig of milk, swallow. Repeat. It used to drive mom crazy. How about dripping some jelly on your shirt like a normal kid, she'd say. He'd smile up at her like she'd paid him a compliment. Dad gave me 10 bucks a week to make sure Teddy ate something besides popsicles, didn't stay in his PJs all day or get run over by a bus. Lousy pay, considering I had to take him with me everywhere I went all summer. But I didn't mind. I liked Teddy. And even if I didn't like him, no one else would hire me since I was too young. I guess if Mom hadn't run off, I wouldn't have a job at all. A whole ton of stuff would be different if mom hadn't run off. And that's the end of chapter one. It's kind of hard to read in this thing. Um, I don't know if you heard today, but apparently President Trump has pardoned Susan B. Anthony. Um, she died a long time ago, but in any event, um, that's, I don't know if Nellie would approve. Um, it's interesting in writing historical fiction because the research is not so much to verify facts, to make sure what you're saying is correct. Oftentimes when I'm doing research, I discover details that I can weave through the story that make it much more interesting, things I never knew about. And that's what makes research, I think, really interesting. One of the things that I do is I go, I went to the library in Boston and I read old newspapers from 1974. And that's where I discovered Moocher. And it's a real story about Moocher and Minnie, the parrots. And he was stolen twice from the Stoneham Zoo in Massachusetts and he got back both times. And he and Minnie raised many, many, many chicks that ended up getting sent all over the country to different zoos. And I just thought it was such a perfect story, both that Nellie would find that really interesting as a kid, and also the story really focuses on family and on families holding together or not. And it seemed like something she would be interested in. So things like that drop in your lap, but you have to read lots and lots and lots 
of newspapers to find the little tidbits that, that work. And to get a feel for the time. I was alive back then, believe it or not. <laughs> but it also is really helpful to read the horoscopes and read the comics in the newspapers and to read the sports scores because Nellie's dad is a Red Sox fan to make sure I got that right, who was winning at what time. And sometimes it makes it really difficult because I want the dad to be mad because the Red Sox are losing, but actually that week of July the Red Sox were doing great and, and I wanted them to be losing. So sometimes you're really tempted to fudge it. But when you know for sure, you really can't. So reading the newspapers is, is really interesting, but it's also kind of like a black hole because you can just keep moving. It's on this microfiche, so it's on this machine and you move the spools because they take photos and line them up on a long spool. It can make you go blind a little bit because it's fuzzy and you just keep reeling through and finding bizarre things. Um, the headlines were very similar to headlines that have been around lately about the impeachment and other issues and war and revolution. But they still had the sports scores and they still had the comics and the horoscopes, which I don't think are quite as popular now. But Nellie reads the horoscope because her mom did every morning. And it's her way of spying on her mom in a weird sort of way to see what kind of day she's having, even though she's not really sure she believes it. Um, the other thing that I did um, was walk around Cambridge and Somerville because Maya, Nellie's best friend, her parents were originally from the Azores, which is a collection of islands in the Atlantic under Portugal. And there were many, many people who migrated to the East Coast and other towns in the United States. Many people from the island of San Miguel in the Azores who lived in Cambridge and Somerville. And I wanted to make sure I had that part right about what it was like to be a 13-year-old kid with parents from the Azores. So I wandered around Somerville and I talked to the travel agent and he told me all these details about the kids, but he didn't have much to say about girls. Then he sent me to the guy who owned the hardware store who had grown up there in 1974. And he told me about playing street hockey out in the street with his buddies and that they had to go in when the whistle blew at the rubber hose factory over in Cambridge. They had to be home by nine. And I said, well, what did you use for a puck? And his, his friend, who was also Italian-American, because there was a big group of Italian-Americans, they were neighbors, what did you use for a puck? And he said, oh, we had the head of an old doll. <laughs> and its nose was squished in, but its ears stuck out. <laughs> and it was perfect, because when you hit it, you didn't lose it. It didn't roll too far because the ears slowed it down. And I, and I was like, oh my gosh, I have to put that in the book. And I did because it was just such a perfect detail. And then I realized I was, still wasn't getting information about girls. So they sent me to the bakery, the Portuguese bakery. And I wanted to try out the bread and these strange little bean cakes that are made in the Azores. And I talked to the baker and she informed me that girls were not allowed to go out by themselves in 1974 who were from families from the Azores. They were extremely strict, extremely strict and girls were pretty much on lockdown. The boys could be outside until the rubber hose factory whistle blew, but the girls were inside. Now, I'd already written the first draft of my book, and my character, Maya, was running around with Nellie all over the place, taking the subway, and my heart sunk. Be whoops, sorry, I hit the mic. But I had to solve it, so I made Maya kind of a rebel. 
and she was sneaking out of the house and lying to her mom that she was going over to my to Nellie's when in fact she was on the subway going to Boston. So she was a little bit of a bad girl. But I ultimately didn't have any choice because the story would have gotten really boring if it had all been in Maya's house where she was locked down. Um, I want to talk a little bit about imagination. Because one of the big questions that people ask is, where do stories come from? Where do you get your ideas? And I wanted to do, whoops, my face. I wanted to do a little activity. Because where my stories come from is writing in my notebook. And if you allow yourself to just free write, no matter what, sometimes ideas come. And that's how Nellie appeared. And that's how the idea of Mount Rushmore, I have no idea where that came from. These three, these brothers named after the presidents. And an, a writer, David Almond, have any of you read Skellig? I highly recommend it. It's just one of my favorite middle grade books. It's old, but it's fabulous. He does this activity that's really interesting because everyone has an imagination, even though some people say, oh, I could never do that. So I'm going to give you a sentence. And I want you to finish the story in your head. Just real quick. You're only going to get about 30 seconds. All right? Mrs. Judkins fell on her butt in the snowbank. Finish the story. Has anyone got a reason or a story? Did you fill in the blank? Yeah. The neighbor next door who didn't really like her saw that she had fallen in the snowbank and said, you know what, maybe I don't like her, but I better go help her anyway because it looked like she was kind of old and having a hurt her. So the grumpy neighbor goes over to help her and they go in the house to get tea and get warm and put on dry clothes. So see, see, she's got a whole story here. How? <laughs> how and if you let yourself just tell it, did you feel yourself sort of, it just kept coming? Like when you're pulling on a string and you don't really know where the string is coming from. Some magical ball of string is somewhere. And if you allow yourself to pull that string, did anyone else get the story? All right. Just give me one sentence. The next sentence in what happens, yeah. So she fell on the snow <laughs> and she was like, oh no, I'm going to be late because my husband is, needs, to, needs my help because he's trapping raccoons. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. And we're all going, oh, raccoons, oh, what's going to happen? Will, will the raccoons have rabies? Will they, you know, will they start doing a tap dance? What's the story here? So you can, sorry, there's another one. They can be very simple. Josie had a big hole in the elbow of her sweater. Just let it come. Anyone want to fill that one in? Where the hole came from? Caught it on the mail, sneaking down the back alley. Oh, sneaking down the back alley. So there's the whole, there you've got tension in your story. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know what she's sneaking about. We don't know whether she actually got cut too. Has anyone got a starter? Tony wanted to climb into his locker at school and shut the door on himself. That one's got kind of a sad feel to it, but maybe not. 
Not everyone's going to see that as sad. Has anyone got an ending to that one or a continuation? How many people actually thought of one but you didn't want to share? <laughs> yeah. Everyone does this. Everyone can do this. Everyone has an imagination. It's baloney that some people have an Im imagination and other people don't. So when you're writing in your notebook, which I highly recommend, just let yourself pull that string. Let yourself tell the story. And you'd be amazed what you come up with. Absolutely amazed. The other thing, how am I doing on time? Oh, good. The other thing that I think is interesting is in investigating your character. Is once you get your character nailed down, you have to figure out everything you possibly can about them. Because the better you know your character, the more you know what their voice sounds like, what they would do in a certain situation. Would they get mad? Would they walk away? Would they get all tense? Would they start kicking things? Would they cry? What is this character like? And when you're writing a novel, you're writing version after another version after another version, and a lot of that is just figuring out who your character is and making them true. And the better you know your character, I think the truer the story is. One of the things that you can do is just brainstorm all the different things about your character. So you can do, what's their favorite color? That one's kind of dorky. That one's way dorky, because I, I never understood that question, but because it really depended on the day. It also depends on how, when you're in fifth grade, you might have a favorite color, but it certainly changes by sixth grade. And then when you're an adult, it changes all the time. But anyway, that one's, we'll get rid of that one. That one's done. But, but the story behind why, you, why your favorite color changed. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. You, there, there's, and that's where you're really digging. Is why is it blue? Why is it blue? Yeah. Absolutely. So at the time of your story, maybe the favorite colors are right. Maybe I have issues with this. I, I don't know. <laughs> so what are the what other questions could you ask about your character? Could you explore? Huh? Is she shy? Shy? Or outgoing? Does she get angry fast? Fast? Never? What other questions could you ask about your character? Does she have any friends? Does she have lots of friends? Or maybe a few close friends? Or she just moved to town and doesn't have any friends? But she loves her dog or her chickens. Where did her scars come from? Where did she, does she have scars? Like a scar on her left knee. And then you're looking at the backstory. What, what, does she play hopscotch? My character plays hopscotch. That's her favorite thing in the world. But she's also 13 and she's sort of having to give up hopscotch. And that's not easy either. So when you investigate your character, you ask all these questions and you write to them. Another thing you can do is write in their voice or write a letter to them or have them write a letter to you. So there's all kinds of things you can do to get to know your character. But it takes a lot of time and they can surprise you. They become very real. 
very real. And the last thing is, when I was at Vermont College of Fine Arts studying writing, there was a teacher there who had a teacher when he studied. And they had this thing called the cheese sandwich moment. <laughs> and I'll never forget this because this is really, really important. When you're writing a book, you don't want your reader to put the book down and get a cheese sandwich. You don't want a cheese sandwich moment. And a cheese sandwich moment is when your mind starts to wander. You're not really wondering what's about to happen. You're getting a little bored. The description of the kitchen goes on for about three pages maybe and you're just like, oh my goodness. How many of you have ever been reading along and hit a cheese sandwich moment? Yeah. They're deadly. You do not ever want your reader to put the book down, ever. That, your goal is you want them to hold on to that book. So that was a really helpful piece of advice. And what I do to try and spot those cheese sandwich moments is to read my book out loud. And you can hear them, especially if you read it to another person. I don't know whether it's picking up their body language, their cheese sandwich body language. <laughs> They're sort of like starting to do this or what. But you can certainly tell. And it helps a lot. So if you're wondering in your writing if you have a cheese sandwich moment, I recommend reading out loud. I absolutely do. Yeah? I have a question. That little detail you put in about the little boy, the brother, wanting the lack to be crisp in the building coloring book. Mm -hmm. That was just so inventive. And did you did you pull out of a memory for that or you just made it up or um, it was just so precise. Part of what I'm trying to do is paint a picture of who these characters are and Rather than say, Teddy is really fussy and neat and doesn't like messes, he's very careful, he lines everything up perfectly. Instead of saying that, I have him do that. So then the reader can pull from that, okay, this is who this kid is. This is not a kid that likes to all over his coloring book. He's very careful. That's what his personality is. So. In just that one line, it covers a lot in that first chapter in painting who this child is. So I'm not saying I deliberately cook that up, but that's what gets left during the revision process, is I know that that's really helping the reader get a sense of who this kid is. So, and it's about, if I just said Teddy was a real fuss budget or Teddy was a real neat neck, it doesn't have the power that it has if the reader figures that out from what Teddy's doing. If the reader has to engage with the text, with the language, and figure out who Teddy is without me telling him or her, then it's much more powerful. So those little tiny moments are really critical. To, to the story, yeah. To that, there we go. Any other questions? Yeah. Do you um, do this kind of mapping out for all of the characters or just a few of the main characters? I write about them, all of them in my journal, but I think mainly for the main characters. Main characters are a pain in the neck. They're just, they're very uncooperative. They don't do what you think they're going to do. They end up changing halfway through, so you have to go back and change the whole beginning. Um, and then you have to be mean to them because 
if you're really nice to your character and they have a perfect life, then it's a cheese sandwich book. <laughs> so you have to sort of, you have to be kind of mean to your main character and then you feel guilty because, you know, you were mean and you really love them at that point. So it's a struggle. It's a struggle. Yeah. Any other questions? So your book is set in Somerville, Mass. What's your personal relationship with Somerville, Mass and why you <laughs> set the book there when you're... I grew up in Boston in the city um, and I lived in Somerville when I was in graduate school so I have that connection to Somerville. In the old days Somerville was a place where just about everyone in New England had lived because it was cheaper rent than Cambridge and if you talk to anyone, oh yeah I used to live in Somerville yeah, yeah. <laughs> everyone has seems to have that connection. Now it's really expensive. It's it's not the Somerville it was, but in those days it was very, very inexpensive. And there are lots of triple decker buildings with an apartment on each floor. Um, so yeah, I lived there. And I also was around there, Boston, during some of the upheaval. So as a teenager, I went to demonstrations and things like that. So I remembered participating in that. Yeah. I had never mowed a lawn until I moved to Hardwick. <laughs> I had no idea about this. Now it's like acres and acres. They're really, Vermonters are kind of a little bit insane about lawns. Just saying. <laughs> They're kind of big. They're like, okay. Tame the wilderness, it seems, I guess. I don't know. But. Somebody's got to do it. <laughs> I guess. Anybody got a question? Yeah. Have you ever written nonfiction? And if so, do you find the two writing processes have anything in common or nothing in common? I haven't written nonfiction. I think it would be really fun. It would be a little more restricting, a little more, a lot more, because you have to be absolutely as accurate as you can be. Um, there's some incredible nonfiction for kids out there now. Unbelievable stuff. Um, but I think, I think I just, I'm drawn to storytelling. And you can often do narrative nonfiction as a story. But I think I go for the little bit quirky and one thing happened in the stories. My when I'm reading the newspapers I saw that the first test tube baby was born. And Nellie's reading this newspaper in the scene I wrote. The first test tube baby and she was really grossed out. She thought that was kind of weird. And how exactly did they do that? And it was a great scene. I really liked it. And then when you're done with the book editing, it goes to what's called the copy editor and they check all your facts. They're incredible, they save your bacon. And the copy editor wrote in the margin, the first test tube baby was not born until 1978. And I'm like, what? It was in the paper and I looked it up. I had digital copies of the article and it was there and they said it. And then I did a little more research. It turned out there was this crazy doctor in England who claimed to have produced the first couple of test tube babies and he was lying. He made the whole thing up. So it was fake news. <laughs> so I was like, oh my God, but I love that scene about the test tube babies and the sperm and it's just like great. And so I was trying to figure out what to do. So I decided this was the actual newspaper that Nellie would read. So as far as she knew, this was the truth. So I put in the afterward, I explained that it was, I didn't say fake news, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I explained it, but I explained it, but th that was really, it. but nonfiction's a real challenge, a real challenge. Any other questions? I was gonna ask you, 
if there were scenes in the book that you had to cut that were really hard to let go of, it sounds like you saved that one. Or are there other place, other things that you had to take out that you really didn't want to? I I think there were quite a few scenes. I'm trying to think. I didn't cut as much from this book as I did from the original book. Actually, this book started out being super, super short. Oh. It was about 120 pages, and I was done. I was done. It was perfect. And I sent it off to a couple of readers, and they begged to differ. <laughs> they were like, you know, maybe you could flesh this out. I'm really anxious when I write about being sentimental and schmaltzy and the emotional arc of the character is really hard for me and that's the thing I have to do at the very, I have to layer that on in every rewrite to try and dig deeper and deeper and deeper till I get there so I went back I was I, I added a hundred pages so and it made it much much better so just the opposite? yeah yeah yeah. Tell them about the problem with the cover. Oh, the cover. Oh, my gosh. Well, I, this can't go public. <laughs> no, I really shouldn't because I'll get in trouble with Macmillan. I'm not supposed to badmouth my publisher. Can we ask you afterwards? Yeah, I can tell you when he shuts the camera off. <laughs> Covers are really tricky because you don't get to pick the artist. You don't, you don't have control at all. You, you can give feedback. If you're really famous, they probably listen to you. Um, but generally, you have absolutely no say in the matter. Um, so it's, it's really scary waiting for your cover because you don't know what they're going to do. I have friends that have just cried themselves to sleep with covers that are just bizarre. You have your next book, are you working on another book right now? I'm working on a happy book because I've written two really sad books and I'm really tired of sad. <laughs> really tired of sad. So I've written, I'm working on an insect road trip and I actually wrote a draft of this a long time ago, but I'm going back to it. It's about a dragonfly in the Smithsonian Insect Zoo. I read one of those early, early drafts. Yes, I in the group. That. In the group. Oh, I'm so glad you're going yeah. back to that. Yeah. I still think about that. <laughs> and we said, I'll really do. Really, oh, thanks. Tanalai really wants to see the blue sky. She's grown up in a tank in the insect zoo. But all the other dragonfly nymphs believe they're going to go to a flying place in the zoo and they're not interested. And she escapes. And it's a rather, when she emerges as an adult dragonfly, she escapes and runs across a honeybee, a ditzy honeybee named Melly, who, <laughs> and she's, she, she's a bee. I try to stick to the science as closely as I can, except for the fact that they talk. <laughs> so you know, it's, it's a little hard if they don't talk. But she's, she, Melly is just beside herself because she's in the wrong hive. She's looking for her queen and her sisters and bees or social insects. So she's having kind of a nervous breakdown because she doesn't have her sisters, her, her hive. So she and Tanalai get together and then they get Mo, who's a housefly, who sort of, flies have evolved with humans. So they know all about humans. So he's sort of the culture broker. <laughs> he, he sort of fills Tanalai and Melly in on, yeah, that's what they do. He's sort of a wise guy. And they have to convince him to help them get out of the Smithsonian. And then it's their journey to find a pond. So it's no grief, no, it's, it's, it's funny. It's very funny, I think. I mean, I laugh out loud when I'm writing it. So.
There you go. <laughs> so, any any other questions? We're we've hit our time, right? The kids haven't asked any questions. I heard any kids talking. This was supposed to be for kids. No pressure or anything. The, the stink eye you were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. It's a lot of pressure because you're kind of outnumbered, <laughs> and that, that's always hard. I don't. I don't blame you for being quiet. Am I way under? No, oh, you're fine. No more questions. <coughs> I, I wonder if the kids have made it. Can I, can I ask the kids a question? The yeah. Prompt a question for you. How many times do you think Daphne wrote that book? Like, how many times do you think she went through it rewriting? Ten. What do you think? What's that? A lot. More than ten or less than ten? Yeah. What do you think more than ten? What do you think? More than ten or less than ten? About ten. About ten. Yeah. This one, my first book, was probably closer to twenty. And it's a really short book. So this was my, yeah. And this one, probably about a dozen times. There were probably four, four or five big, huge revisions. So um, when their teachers ask them to rewrite something, should they get angry? Well, you can be a little peeved. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, you have to do it, but you don't have to, and, and then well, it's always frustrating, but it just gets better and better and better. And I would recommend setting something aside and not going right back at it. So if your parent reads it and then says, go rewrite this and add this, 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 then say, well, I need to set it aside for a day, and that's fine. Because you can see it more clearly. Can we get that right? Can they get that right? <laughs> <laughs> and read it out loud to your cat or your dog. Right. And avoid cheese sandwiches. <laughs> Even in essays and stuff, they're brutal. So keep it lively. But yeah, writing is, it's a fantasy that people write first time around anything decent. It's just. Have you ever heard of an author who's done that? Just such a the whole book in one sitting? Besides James Joyce? No. Have you, Brett? What was the question? Okay, have you written a? Have you ever heard of anyone who's written a book in one sitting? Just first draft? Nah. Well, you could, but it may not be a very good book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm writing now. It's interesting hearing you say that. I have rewritten this book countless times. I mean, countless times. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it shows in your book, too. It's well written. It shows. So thanks for rewriting it. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. It's hard work, writing. But it's incredibly gratifying. It's fun. And it's fun to pull that string and make up stories. Just don't ever tell yourself you don't have an imagination because everybody does. Just got to go there. Anything else? Okay. Oh, we're going to do the drawing. <laughs>